Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to teach you how you can create an escape room puzzle using a colour sensor like this one. Now, I've actually got uh, two different types of colour sensors set up on the board behind me. Here I've got a TCS3200, and over here I've got a slightly more recent TCS34725, but they both work in broadly the same way. Um, I've got them wired to Arduino Nanos, and then I'm also using a NeoPixel ring here. Now, if I turn on my serial monitor output from this Arduino here, um, and then I'm going to take just a, a coloured object like this purple box here, when I hold it up to the colour sensor, what you'll be able to see in the serial monitor window is the RGB values uh, of the object that's been detected by the sensor. And then I'm using those values to set the LEDs in the ring. So basically what this sketch is doing is detecting the colour of the object here and making the LEDs match. Uh, on this sensor it works exactly the same way. Now I'm aware that my uh, webcam is uh, has a habit of kind of blowing out colours a bit so um, I'm hoping that you can actually see that but um, you'll sort of just have to take my word for it if not that that's a fairly accurate colour recreation of the object that's being held in front of it. If I just swap them over that might be easier to see. Um, so you could have a puzzle for example that required players to find certain coloured objects in a room, hold them up uh, one at a time in front of the sensor and use that as a kind of a, an input mechanism. But if I'm totally honest that's not a great escape room puzzle for a, a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, obviously any puzzle that involves colour is a potential accessibility issue for any players that suffer from colour blindness, which is a small but significant minority. And the other thing is, if what you really want players to do is to find a particular object in a room, there's probably better ways to detect it than relying on its colour. Um, so, I mean, normal object identification puzzles in escape rooms where you have to place, you know, certain statuettes on certain plinths and things like that would probably use RFID or magnets instead, which are a kind of a easier and perhaps more robust solution than detecting an object's colour, which depends very much on the lighting of the room and things like that. However, having said that, there are some situations in which colour sensors actually do present opportunities that you might not be able to get with other methods of detection. Now with everything that's going on in the world at the moment, uh, obviously most escape rooms are actually shut for players, but they're still able to experience them remotely through a uh, live video stream. So that's where you've got an avatar in the room that players are directing over a video chat system like Zoom or something like that, and uh, the players are just experiencing the escape room through uh, a screen, so it's video mediated. And as a result, it's very important that puzzles need to have a strong graphical and visual element. You know, a, a tactile puzzle is not going to work at the moment. You need something that's, that's got a strong visual appeal, and a colour puzzle clearly has that. And the other thing it means is that because you've got that avatar mediating the actions of all the players, it does mean that you can actually have puzzles that maybe you wouldn't want to have if the players were in the rooms themselves. Um, so for example, a liquid puzzle. Now, um, if you are a GM in a real life escape room, you probably know that any puzzles involving liquids can be a bit of a potential nightmare. You don't really want players mixing them together and spilling them all over the room. But if you're doing a remote video room where you've got your GM handling the liquids, uh, you can actually come up with some pretty cool puzzle ideas. So uh, just to demonstrate, obviously here I've got a blue liquid and when I hold that up to the sensor you can see a nice blue ring. I've got a yellow liquid here as well. And if I take these lids off like that and attempt to mix them together, if I do that on camera even, that would be even better, wouldn't it? So let's mix them together like that. And then let me just put the lid back on so I don't spill it everywhere myself. And what I now have is a nice gloopy green liquid. Uh, and if I hold that up, you'll see, there we go. I've created effectively an input to my puzzle that didn't exist uh, until that action happened. We only had the blue and yellow liquids. So actually, 
Um, and that wouldn't really be possible in any other way. There's not an RFID puzzle that allows you to combine items and suddenly get a new RFID tag. So color sensors um, do have some uh, pretty unique uses and maybe you can think of an example of a way you could use them in one of your rooms. So let's take a look at the hardware in a bit more detail. Now, if you search for a color sensor on the internet, the chances are you'll probably end up with something that looks like this one. This is a TCS3200 color sensor module, but you might also find it described as a TCS230. Um, that's actually the slightly older model of chip, but it's functionally identical. Now you'll see it's got four LEDs around the outside. That's simply to illuminate the object that you're looking at. And then in the center of the board, you've got the sensor chip itself. Now, if you were to take a close look at that chip, you'd see it looks like this. Those little colored squares in the middle are actually light sensitive photodiodes. And the reason why they're different colors is because they've got different filters in front of them to make them sensitive to different colors of light. So you can see there's 16 red diodes, 16 green, 16 blue, and there are 16 clear unfiltered diodes. Now, at the top of the board, you'll see that there's two pins here labeled S2 and S3. And the point of those pins is to be able to set different combinations of those diodes to be active or not. So, for example, if we set uh, S2 to be low and S3 to be high, that would activate only the red photodiode types. And if we set uh, low and high, that would be only the blue photodiodes, and high and high would be the green ones. And by doing that, we can actually record the separate components of the colour of the object we can see in front of the sensor. Now, there's a single output pin here labelled out, and that contains the output from the sensor as a square wave. So what that means is it uh, alternates regularly between a high and a low signal. And the frequency of that wave, uh, so the speed at which it uh, flips between high and low, that's proportional to the intensity of the light detected by the currently active diodes. Um, so that's a little bit tricky to get your head around, but I'll, I'll go over that in um, a moment. But just before I do, we've also got two more pins at the bottom here. We've got S0 and S1 and they control a sort of a scale factor for that output value. So you can think of these as sort of being like the sensitivity of the uh, module. Um, so let's say we actually want to, to use this to measure the, the colour of an object in front of the sensor. What we do is first of all we could set pins S2 and S3 low to only activate the red photodiodes here. And then we'd set the scale value that we want at the bottom here. And then we could connect the output pin here to uh, a GPIO pin on Arduino and use the pulse in function to measure the length uh, of, between pulses on that output pin. So that's measuring the frequency of the square wave on this output pin here. And then what we do, uh, so that would give us a value for just what the red photodiodes are seeing. Then we could set the S2 and S3 values to only activate the green diodes and repeat that again and measure the output pin to get a green value. And then we set S2 and S3 again to activate only the blue photodiodes and we take a third measurement. So now we've got three values representing the RGB uh, value components of the colours of light seen by the sensor. Now, there's still a little bit of work to actually make those values usable, unfortunately. Although they represent the uh, RGB components of the light, they're not really in a very convenient scale at the moment. Um, those values are actually measured in uh, milliseconds because that's what the, the pulse in value gives you. Um, so in order to convert them to something we can send to the, the near pixel ring, which is normally a byte value from 0 to 255, we'll have to do a bit more uh, manipulation in the code, but I'll show you that later. Um, but first of all, let me show you how you'd wire this sensor up. So I've got my colour sensor at the top here, and I've got it shown wired to an Arduino Uno, but uh, in practice that could be any sort of Arduino or any microprocessor, in fact. There's nothing Uno-specific about this project. And then just because I wanted to uh, recreate the demonstration I showed at the start of this video, I've also included the wiring to a NeoPixel LED ring here. 
Um, so this is just going to change the color of the LEDs to match uh, the color value detected by the sensor at the top here. It's obviously not required for the actual sensing part of the project, um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, have a full demonstration of, of what I actually showed at the beginning of the video. So we've got the, the input here, and here we've got the output. So in terms of the, uh, the wiring itself, the module, the color sensor module has a five volt input that's going to the VCC pin here and also ground. Uh, so they're connected to five volt and ground over here. Now on this board, uh, we've also got this output enable pin, the OE pin over here. And what this pin does, it it's, uh, allows you to control whether the sensor is uh, active or not. So when this pin is pulled low to ground, that means that the sensor is on. And if it has a high signal written to it, it means that the sensor is off. Now in my case, um, I've actually got that tied to the same ground line that I've got coming in here. So my sensor is always going to be on. And there's kind of no reason normally why you wouldn't want that to be the case. You might even find on your board that you don't have an OE pin. It might be permanently soldered to ground on the board as it is. But let's say you're running a, a battery powered project, for example, uh, there might be a case when you wanted to turn the sensor off so that it wasn't drawing any power when you didn't want to use it. Um, and in that case, you could have this OE pin wired to a spare GPIO pin on your Arduino here. And by writing a high signal to that pin, you could turn the sensor off. And then when you wanted it, you could write a low signal to turn it on again. But uh, in the wiring diagram here, I've got it permanently on. We've then got the uh, S2 and S3 pins. They're the ones that control which photodiodes are active. And we've got the S0 and S1 pins. They're the ones that control the scaling factor of the square wave output. And they are going each individually to their own pin. So I'm using pins four, five, six, and seven down here. Uh, but they could really be going to any, any spare pins you've got on your Arduino. We've then got a single output pin from the sensor back to the Arduino. And for that, I'm using pin eight. And again, that could really be any spare pin. So it doesn't have uh, much requirements in terms of specific pins that you have to use, but it does actually use quite a lot of inputs and outputs. Um, depending on which board you're using here, um, you know we've got five GPIO pins being consumed by the sensor here, which, which might actually have an effect on how you can control other uh, inputs and outputs to your project. Then when it comes to the, uh, the LED ring over here, um, so again, I've got uh, five volt, and ground uh, supplies and I've also got a capacitor placed close to uh, those inputs there so I'm going between the 5 volt and the ground line this is a 0.1 millifarad capacitor uh, it's always a good idea to have one of these just um, when the LEDs first turn on you often get quite a current uh, surge requirements when they all turn on and this capacitor will help fulfill those uh, requirements we've then also got a, a data in signal line and that is going to pin 10 on the Arduino and it's got a 330 ohm resistor as well. Um, again, that's not an exact value, anything between about 300 and 500 ohms um, on that resistor line there, but you shouldn't connect data in straight to an output from an Arduino. It may work straight away, but you do risk uh, damaging your near pixels. So that's always best practice to have that um, just before the first LED in the strip. Uh, so that's it. Now here's the other sensor I'm using. This is the TCS34725 and this is a newer model of colour sensor. It too contains an array of photodiodes and there's an LED in the middle of the board here to illuminate the subject again. But unlike the TCS3200, um, you don't need to manually select different filters or take multiple measurements with this sensor. Uh, here there's actually a, a little control unit on the board itself that does all that for you. Also, the diodes on this unit have an infrared blocking filter built into them, uh, which means that they more accurately capture the colour that would be seen by the human eye, um, because we can't normally see infrared light ourselves. So if you have a sensor that blocks that out, you get a, a more realistic capture of the true colour value. And also, rather than having to measure the frequency of an output wave on an output pin, 
Um, this actually has an I2C interface, so you can connect to and retrieve the RGB color value directly from the sensor. So it's much simpler to use and you're likely to get better results from it as well. Now for the TCS34725, you'll see the wiring is much, much simpler. Uh, over this side, I've still got my NeoPixel LED ring just as before, but the wiring to the color sensor itself, I've now simply got ground and five volts in, and then I've just got uh, the I2C lines, so the data line, SDA, that's going to pin A4, and the clock line, SCL, that's going to pin A5, and that's it, just those two uh, connections there. Now, uh, the I2C interface on a Arduino always uses those two analog pins, um, so you've lost two analog pins, you can't assign them to anywhere else, but if you've got other I2C devices that you want to connect to as well, you can create uh, an entire network, an I2C bus of devices that still only use those same two pins. Um, so it's a much cleaner, it's a much more efficient way of, of connecting devices. And it does mean that you've got all these spare pins up at the top still, uh, which in the previous color sensor were all being used up uh, with those S0, S1, S2, S3, etc. So it's a, it's a much neater arrangement of wiring. So let's take a look at the Arduino code and we'll start off looking at the TCS3200 code. Uh, so if you followed any of my projects in the past, you'll know that I always use a, a fairly constant sort of uh, template and structure. So we'll start off with the includes at the top. So this is any external code libraries uh, that you're making use of. Now, I'm not actually using any external libraries for the color sensor itself. Uh, all of the code relating to that is contained in this listing. However, I am using the fast LED library just to uh, control the LED ring which I'm using. And you can download that library from here. Uh, so then we go on to the defines. Uh, so the top one here, this is fairly obvious. This is just the number of LEDs in the uh, NeoPixel ring that we're controlling with the fast LED library. Now, just to make it clear, you don't need to use a, uh, a ring of LEDs here at all. You could just use a single uh, RGB LED and light it up the color of the detected color on the sensor. In fact, you don't need to have an LED at all. Um, but I just find that it has more visual effect if you have kind of a, a whole ring of them. So I'm using 32 here, but that's just a, a totally arbitrary number. That is the, the size of the, the ring I happen to have available to hand. Uh, so don't worry too much about that. Now this calibrate function here, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, when you take the reading from the sensor output pin of the, uh, the TCS3200, you haven't really got a usable RGB value. What you've got is the timing of the square wave when you have the red, green and blue photodiodes activated. And you have to do a bit of work to manipulate that. And that's how this calibrate mode is going to work. So this is uh, a definition at the top of the code. When you first use this code listing, you're going to have to run it at least once with this calibrate mode enabled. And what that's going to do is that's going to output uh, some raw sensor readings a bit later on. You'll see this section here only gets executed in calibration mode. And we're going to use that to help map the raw sensor values into RGB values. But I'll explain that in a bit more detail later on. Then we get the uh, the constant section here. So these are variables that are not going to change throughout the duration of the code. And we'll start off with some pin definitions. So we've got uh, pins uh, five and four on the Arduino are going to S0 and S1 on the sensor. And these are the pins that control the scaling factor of the output wave. Then I'm using pins six and seven to go to S2 and S3. Uh, these are the ones that control the selection of different colored filtered diodes on the sensor. And then I've got the output pin uh, from the sensor going to Arduino pin eight. But again, if you're using a different wiring, you know, you can just change those to, to whatever pins you're using. Now, uh, the next section here, I've got two arrays, each containing three elements. 
uh, for black reading and white reading. And this takes us back to that calibration mode again. So I'll probably need to go into it in more detail here. So what we need to do in order to get an RGB value, we need to be able to convert the sensor readings from a kind of an arbitrary range to a range between 0 and 255, which is going to represent a, a byte value. So what we need to do is, well, what sensor reading do we get when we are looking at a black object? Because that's the absence of any colour. And what sensor value do we get when we're looking at a white object? Because that's the sort of the maximum of all of the light intensity of all of the different filtered diodes. Uh, so that's what we're going to record here. First of all, what you need to do is you need to have the calibrate mode enabled, so this line here, and then you run the sketch and you hold up a black uh, swatch sample uh, or, you know, or turn all the lights off. You make the environment as dark as uh, it's going to ever be, basically. Uh, and when you do that, you take a recording from the serial monitor of what the sensor values are in that condition. And whatever they are, you uh, type them into this section of code up here. So that's going to be your red, green and blue photodiode outputs in a totally dark environment. Because that's going to be the lowest RGB value that you're going to obtain from your setup. And then you repeat that again, but this time you uh, look at a white object. So this is going to give you the the extreme highest light intensity that the sensor is ever going to detect. Um, and what you'll see here, uh, so again you repeat that, you look at the sensor outputs in the serial monitor window of the raw sensor values there, and you should find that these values are lower than the black reading. So the way that this sensor is set up, uh, when the light intensity is higher, the frequency of the square wave on that output pin there goes up and that means that the time recorded between pulses goes down and that's what this uh, measurement here is actually. This is a, a measurement in uh, microseconds. So the time between pulses for a higher intensity light is going to be less than it is for a lower intensity light. So this is going to give us the, the white and black, that's going to give us the extreme ends of our scale. And if we apply those values for each of the red, the green and the blue uh, photodiode arrays, we'll be able to map any other colour value to lie somewhere in that range. Uh, so that's what, uh, that's what this section here does. Then we go on to the globals. Uh, so globals are variables which are shared between a number of functions in the code. Uh, we'll define an LED array. Uh, this is going to contain the RGB values of the output that we send to our NeoPixel ring. And we'll also uh, record a three element array of what the current reading is from the sensors. And also we'll have that corresponding to a color value. So these two variables here are the same uh, it, they, they describe the same thing, but this is going to be in terms of the sensor values and this is going to be in terms of a colour value after it has been uh, mapped based on these readings here. Okay. Right, now we go into the setup function. So this is what runs when the code first starts uh, running. We'll initialise a serial monitor just so we can actually see those calibration values and also the output of what the sensor is reading at the moment. We'll initialize all the pins, so obviously S0, 1, 2 and 3, these are all outputs that the Arduino is using to control the sensor. And the sensor output pin, this is going to be an input into the Arduino because we're going to read the output value on that pin. We'll uh, set the scaling factor, so um, I'm using a 2% scaling factor, so this is done by writing S0 low and S1 high. Uh, so that's this value here. Now you can adjust the scaling factor to your particular project how you want. What it means is that the, if you have a, a, a scaling factor higher, what it means is that the values you return will have a greater degree of precision in them, but it will actually take longer to record the duration of the pulse on the square wave. So it's going to slow your code down a little bit. So just like in sort of many other decisions, it's a trade-off here between uh, accuracy and performance. This I find works well for me, um, but if you're not getting 
reliable values from that, you can try one of these other scaling factors instead. Um, obviously not the power down one, sorry, one of these. Um, just know that if you adjust the values here, obviously you will also need to adjust the calibration values that you get here because these will be uh, recorded at a totally different scale than they were before. So, um, you know, I just set this to something that gives you a sensible range of values and then kind of leave it like that, basically. And we'll initialize uh, the LED strip here. So uh, I've used fast LED and near pixel strips in a lot of previous projects. There's lots of documentation about it. Um, but what this is saying is this is the style of LEDs I'm using. So WS2812B or near pixels. This is the data pin, which I'm using on my Arduino to control them. Uh, this is the color order, and then this is the array of LEDs and the number of elements in the array. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of documentation for that syntax online. And now we go into the main loop function itself. So this is the program code that's going to be running round and round while the sensor is active. And you'll see that there's three sections of code here at the top, which are all largely repeating ourselves because this is exactly how you have to poll this sensor. What we do first of all is we select a particular subset of those uh, color filtered photodiodes and by convention let's start with looking at the red ones. So we do that by writing a low signal to both S2 and S3 and then we record what the sensor value is with that combination of filters active. So we're using the pulse in function. What this will do is it will uh, count in microseconds how long it is between a, a pin going high and a pin going low. So we'll, uh, and we've got this square wave arriving from the sensor. So that's the perfect function to use. So we'll listen on the sensor output pin. Um, we'll count how long it is and this bit uh, here, this is a little bit complicated. So imagine we've got this square wave which is alternating between high and low and it's got a 50% duty cycle. So what that means is it actually spends equal time being high and low. It's a, a perfectly kind of symmetrical wave as it were. So when we first read the sensor output pin, it's either going to be high or low at the moment and what we want to do is to count how long it is before it switches to the other state. And that's kind of what this uh, slightly weird um, kind of thing here is. If we only listened for it to uh, turn low or only listened to it to turn high, when we first polled it, we kind of might be in the middle of that section of a wave as it is. So we're not getting a full cycle of wave. Uh, so this... Uh, this is called a ternary condition here. So we're saying take a reading of whatever the value is of the sensor at the moment. If it's high, what we'll do is we want to listen for the next low pulse. And if it's low, we want to listen for the next high pulse. It's a little bit complicated if you're not used to that syntax, but don't worry too much about it. You can copy and paste it exactly like that and it'll work fine. And that will give us the first element in the current reading value. That's going to be our red reading. We'll then do that exactly the same, but this time we'll set S2 and S3 both to high, and that activates the green photodiodes. And then we'll populate that in the next element in our current reading array. And then we do it all again with S2 low and S3 high. That will give us just the blue sensor reading, which we'll put into the third element. So we've now got a current reading here, that has got three elements which are the red, green and blue sensor readings. Now at the moment they're still raw readings, okay? If we are in calibration mode, what we're going to do is we're then going to output those values to the serial monitor. So um, we're going to output raw sensor values, uh, current reading 0, 1 and 2. And we're going to send them there. And what you would do at this point now is uh, hold up your white or black card, get those values and copy them into the code here. Okay, 
Now, if we're um, not in calibration mode, that means that what we're going to do is we've already got our white and black values set in the code. So now we can go about converting the sensor values to where they lie somewhere in that white to black spectrum. And that's going to give us a, a, an RGB value we can use instead. So that's this section of code here. So we're going to loop over the three components, so red, green, blue. And we're going to use this map function here. So the Arduino map function can rescale a variable from uh, any kind of arbitrary scale, so a scale of 0 to 10, let's say, to any other arbitrary scale, which might be 255 to 32,000 or whatever, things like that. So the order of the um, parameters here, we're going to pass it the current reading for this component. Uh, we're going to pass it whatever the black reading we got for this component was. So this is the lowest possible value that this uh, set of filter diodes detected. Then we're going to pass it the white reading. So this is the highest possible value that this photodiode detected. And we're going to rescale it from that scale, which was what the, the kind of the input scale was in. We're going to put it into this scale instead. So 0 to 255, which is the common uh, byte format of a single color. So, you know, when you look at a, a hex code for a color on the web or something like that, that's a three byte value. So each of the red, green and blue components is now somewhere between naught and 255. And lastly, we're going to use the constrain function. So uh, what happens here, let's say that we, we had a slightly erroneous value and and when we took our white readings, it wasn't quite the maximum value. The sensor is now reading something that's above the white reading. Well, if that happened, then the map value here will return something higher than 255, and we don't want that to happen. So the constraint function here just says, basically, if you get anything lower than zero, let's clamp it to zero. And if you get anything higher than 255, let's clamp it to 255. So... In an ideal world, if your black and white readings here were perfectly accurate uh, and the sensor reading was always perfectly accurate, this shouldn't be required. But it's kind of more of a safety step just to make sure that, uh, that those values are true and lie within an acceptable range. And then what we'll do, so up here we output the, uh, the raw sensor values if we're in calibration mode. In this section here, we're doing almost exactly the same thing, but now we're going to do the remapped RGB color values. Um, and we'll just put them in uh, brackets and separate them by commas. So this will give us, hopefully, a recognizable RGB value. And this is what I showed in the, the serial monitor at the start of the video. Okay, so uh, that's outputting it to the serial monitor. What else can we do with this RGB value? Well, there's two more things we might want to do with it. The first thing is we might want to compare it to a target colour. So this is the case where you're using uh, this code as an input to a, a puzzle or something like that and players have to display an object of the correct colour uh, in order to be regarded as an input. Well that's what this section of code does here. So what we're going to do is we're going to define what the RGB values of the target colour are. So this is the object that we want the players to present to the sensor. And we'll also define a threshold that defines how accurate uh, the sensor recording has to be to determine whether it matches those RGB values or not. So I'm using a threshold of 100 here. Um, again, you, this is just something you'll want to play around with depending on uh, how sensitive you want there to be and, and, and how much leeway in the way that players present the item and, and false positives and false negatives and things like that. But start with 100 and see how you get on. And then what we'll do is we'll calculate something called the colour distance between the colour that is currently being detected by the sensor, that's these three values here, and the target colour, which we just defined up here, and the colour distance, this is uh, defined in this function here, so this is a very simply, uh, this is a what's called a Euclidean distance uh, between two values. So we take the distance in the red components and we square it. And then we take the distance in the green components and we square that. And we take the 
distance between the blue components and we square that. So the reason for squaring is not only does it magnify the extent of the difference between them but also it doesn't matter whether b1 is higher or lower than b2 for example because by the time you square it it's going to end up with a positive difference anyway and we add up all of those differences together that is going to give you a value that represents the uh, the difference between the target value and the actual measured value and if that is less than the acceptable threshold that we put up here we're going to say okay that's a match and in this section of code here you could type um, anything you want so I've just put a, a serial print line message but this is the point where you could activate a relay uh, you know to unlock a mag lock you could uh, do anything you really wanted in this section and you could move on to the next step of the puzzle so maybe you have to present a sequence of colored items in the right order uh, in which case you would simply uh, advance and, and check the color distance between a new target color instead the other thing um, which you might want to do having calculated the RGB value value up here is obviously to set the uh, LEDs of the NeoPixel ring and that is very simply what this last section of the code does here. So we'll loop over the number of LEDs. So remember this was the number of LEDs in the pixel strip. I'm using 32 and I'm going to set them all to exactly the same value so I'm not doing any complicated animation effects or anything like that I'm just looping over every single one and I'm setting them to the RGB values of the color that we remapped up here uh, which in turn was based on the sensor value which had been adjusted to the black and white readings and we call the fast LED dot show method to actually send that array to the NeoPixel strip and that is it and to contrast, here's the code that runs the TCS34725 sensor. And you'll see that it is um, substantially smaller and simpler than the previous example. Uh, now, one of the reasons for that is that I am using an external library here. You can get that from this link here. Although, actually, there's not that much done in that library. It's mainly to set up the I2C connection to the sensor. Um, again, I'm including the fast LED library for the output. Again, I'm defining the number of LEDs. This time I'm using a slightly smaller NeoPixel ring, so I've only got 16. And then when we get to the global section there, you'll notice that I no longer have to have the raw sensor values or the black and the white readings or any of that calibrate mode because that is all done within the TCS sensor itself. This is why this code is, is substantially simpler. So what we do is we actually create an object uh, from the TCS library here. Uh, we define the LEDs which are going to have in our NeoPixel array. And then in the setup function, just as before, we initialize a serial connection. We don't need that for calibration anymore, but we'll still use it to send the uh, output for debugging. We'll initialize the uh, LEDs and then this section here is new so we're going to begin a wire interface now wire is the inbuilt Arduino library for interfacing with any uh, I2C components so this is kind of a built-in uh, function here and then once that is started we'll call the specific function that initializes the TCS sensor on the I2C interface. So that's what this bit here does. We'll try attaching the, the TCS sensor to the, uh, the wire I2C interface that we began here. Now assuming that that's correct we carry on. If there was any problems we'll just output an error to the serial monitor here. And now we do have some options to uh, configure the sensor. Um, I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail here because they're explained here. This is a little bit like the scaling factor um, which we saw was controlled by the S0 and S1 pins um, on the TCS3200. Um, so there are different sensitivities which you can set um, but I found that these are the defaults and these work well for me so I'd suggest you kind of leave these alone unless you have a particular reason to adjust them. And then in the loop function itself, so you can see I can actually fit this all on a, a single screen now. Um, 
The first thing we do is we check whether the sensor has some values ready to be read. That's what the available uh, function here does. And if it does, what we'll do is we'll retrieve whatever color it can currently detect. And notice that this is already a color value. So we don't have anything about this um, frequency of square waves or wavelengths or mapping, things like that. What we are getting here is a color value that has R, G and B components. So we'll just output those directly to the serial monitor and then we can go straight on to use that in the different methods we want to do. So again this is the code that you could use to detect whether the color detected by the sensor was similar enough to a target color. So we define our R, G and B components of the target color and our threshold and we'll call the get color distance function again. So this is exactly the same as in the previous code listing. We just determine the differences uh, between the red values and the pre-stored values, square them and compare the result to the threshold. If it's within the threshold, then we've got a match and we can do whatever uh, function we want here. And then also, just as before again, we can loop over all of the LEDs in our LED strip and we can set them based on the color value and show it. So this is really so much simpler to use, mainly because of this method here. So a combination of the fact that the sensor itself uh, is able to do a lot of the um, processing work, and then the use of this library up here then exposes that value sort of really conveniently, means that we can just retrieve the color directly. So this is definitely a a simpler sensor to use. I will just point out that even though uh, this takes away a lot of the complications for you, you do still need to do that adjustment to allow for um, the environment and the ambient lighting in which you're using it. So what you may find is that the the actual values that you get here, the color dot r, the color dot g, and the color dot b, might not match exactly what your NeoPixel displays here, you might still have to do uh, a little bit of adjustment because things like the the colour temperature of the lights of the room that you're in, you know, most interior lights have a kind of a yellowy hue to them, um, whereas natural daylight has a very different colour temperature and all sorts of other fluorescent lighting will make colours appear differently. There's nothing you can do about that, that's just the um, the physics of optics, how it works. Um, so this is uh, substantially easier to use, but what you may find, you still have to do a bit of uh, manual adjustment hit between this value and this value here. And you may also need to uh, adjust your threshold values here appropriately, uh, just to account for the fact that, you know, light is not straightforward and, and colour is, is actually a bit more subjective than it might initially appear. But other than that, uh, this is all the code that you'd need to use. So I hope this video has given you some ideas and possible inspiration as to how you could use a colour sensor as part of an escape room puzzle. And I guess as a games designer, it's always good to have a whole range of different possible inputs that players can have to make interesting interactions in the room. So alongside RFID and magnetic sensors and you get uh, UV and infrared and switches and buttons and all these other different inputs and colour is really just one more of those. And as I tried to demonstrate with the uh, liquids example earlier, there are some kind of unique puzzle mechanics that you can use with a colour sensor that would be very hard to do with uh, any other type of sensor. Now, um, one thing I ought to mention is all the examples I've shown so far have dealt with uh, reflected light. So if you hold up a red object to the sensor, um, what's happening is that it is reflecting the light from the LEDs here back onto the uh, photodiode array. But these also work with um, emitted light. So if you have coloured torches, for example, uh, or a gel filter over a lens, and you can point that at the colour sensor. And in fact, you can have multiple light sources of different uh, wavelengths, different frequency light, and they can combine to create colour mixing puzzles as well. So if you didn't want to do the uh, mixing yellow and blue liquids to make green, for example, you could mix different light sources instead and have them overlap. 
Um, so maybe in a, a room set in a movie studio or something like that, you can imagine the spotlights with different filters on and having to point them all at the same time over the sensor to create a, a certain hue of colour. That might be quite a fun puzzle. Um, as with all my previous projects that I put on this channel, I will be uploading the uh, code for the Arduinos and also um, the list of parts that I've used and, and links to where I got these from, things like that. I will put those all on my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. Um, if you would like to, and if you are able to uh, support me on there, that would be amazing. Um, my amazing patrons uh, help me to continue to make these kind of videos uh, every month. Uh, and if you'd like to support me to do that in the future, that would be great. If not, don't worry about it. Um, I will carry on creating these videos anyway, and you feel free to comment below. I will do my best to help you um, if you would try to use this kind of project in your room somewhere. Um, as always, you know, I love to hear examples if you've got, if you end up using this or if you've got examples of how you'd like to see it used, do let me know. I really, really appreciate hearing from people all around the world that have kind of implemented these ideas. Um, I think that's an uh, amazing uh, community of escape room designers that exist in the world and it's always lovely to hear from you. Um, but if not, stay safe and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks very much for watching.